thing I want to thank the organizers for, uh, for asking me to speak here. Uh, it's been an uh, amazing conference, um, amazing to see the diversity of mathematics that uh, has been collected here. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk um, about homotopy theory and some different ways of thinking about the role the homotopy groups of spheres play in mathematics and, and how we approach the homotopy groups of spheres. <clears throat> and it's kind, of a, it's kind of an interesting thing just to go back and, and ask how we got interested in the question in the first place. Um, so the homotopy groups of spheres, I'm going to look at pi n plus k of Sn. That's maps from the n plus, pointed maps from the n plus k sphere into the n-sphere modulo the equivalence relation of homotopy. And <clears throat> one, of the earliest, um, one of the earliest uses or one of the earliest reasons for studying the homotopy groups of spheres occurs in, uh, in the work of, of Pontryagin in the 1930s when he generalized the Brouwer-Hopf theorems about the degree of a map. So Pontryagin, uh, let, me, let me just make a picture. Let's, this is supposed to be the graph of a map from the n plus k sphere to the n sphere. And <clears throat> Pontryagin um, st studied these by picking a regular value and looking at the geometry of the inverse image of this regular value. So in this case, the inverse image of this regular value is a, it's a manifold of dimension k. And it has a, because this is a point in a fixed space, a fixed uh, sphere, um, the normal bundle to this manifold in this sphere comes trivialized. And if I pick a, so Pontryaga wanted to study these maps uh, in terms of the geometry of this manifold. And um, if I pick a different regular value, I'll get a different manifold, and the area between them is a manifold of one higher dimension whose boundary is these two pieces. So if this is M1 and this is M2, M1 and M2 are cobordant. And he set up a, a, a bijection between the homotopy groups of spheres and cobordism classes of manifolds. So, so this was one. This was one thing the homotopy groups of spheres were supposed to tell us about. They were supposed to tell us about manifolds. Although in Pontryagin's day, the information flow went the other direction because um, we knew more about the theory of manifolds, at least in low dimensions, than we did about maps between spheres. Um, the other, the other picture, the other sort of role for the homotopy groups of spheres, which in a way you which sort of emerged in the 1950s was uh, J.H.C. Whitehead's CW complexes. And that says that you build a, you build a space by, um, well, maybe I won't, I, won't draw, I won't draw pictures or give the definition, but it says you, you, the spaces we're interested in, we build by, um, by uh, attaching cells. And the basic recipes for attaching cells are, um, are elements in the homotopy groups of spheres or the homotopy groups of other spaces. So in Pontryagin's picture, these were supposed to tell us about manifolds um, kind of externally. And in Whitehead's picture, they were supposed to tell us about spaces kind of internally. <clears throat> now. Um, so that's, that's kind of an, an old philosophical point about the, some of the roles the homotopy groups of spheres might play in mathematics. Um, so to get my story out and to even explain the title of my talk, I have to go back and remind you a little bit about constructing maps between spheres. And this is also something very old. I want to remind you about the Hopf construction. 
So Hopf um, was the first person to construct non-trivial maps between diff spheres of different dimensions. And um, he started with a map from the k minus 1 sphere across the n minus 1 sphere um, to the n minus 1 sphere. And um, I knew I was going to do this. Uh, um, I'm. Uh, well, you're just going to have to forgive me. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to get the dimensions. My k is going to switch to a k minus 1. So he started with a map like this, and he produced out of it uh, a map from construction down here. He, he constructed out of this a map from the n plus k minus 1 sphere to the n, n sphere. All right. And to do that, the easiest, the fastest thing to say is you, you um, extend this to, the, to two different disks. You, you, you use the, the cone coordinate on the disk to extend it over, over these two, and then the push out of this square is the n plus k minus 1 sphere, and the push out of this square, of this diagram, is the n sphere, and this is, this is the map. <clears throat> so this, you're, you're in good shape here because you, these maps you might be able to pr produce from linear algebra. So, so for example, um, so this is, so Hoff studied these, and then George Whitehead um, generalized Hoff's, Hoff's construction, or Hoff's work, and pointed out that, uh, yes, thank you. All right, then George Whitehead uh, <coughs> pointed out that there is a, a great repository of these coming from linear algebra. So if I have a map from the k minus 1 sphere into on, it'll actually land in son and into the n by n orthogonal group. I can restrict that to the unit sphere and get a map from the k minus 1 sphere, get an action of the k minus 1 sphere on the n minus 1 sphere. In other words, I can, if I just look for linear actions, I might have a better chance of finding these in nature. And that gives me an element in pi. Uh, n plus k minus 1 of Sn. <clears throat> now these maps classify n-dimensional vector bundles over the k minus 1 sphere, over the k sphere. That's the clutching data for an n-dimensional vector bundle over the k sphere. And you produce a map from this set of n-dimensional vector bundles over a sphere to the homotopy groups of spheres. And that map's called the J, it's called J, or it's called the J homomorphism. And there's some, so this is a, there's some good news and some bad news here. Um, um, so let's, let's start, uh, let's just take that directly. Um, right now I don't know a lot of vector bundles over the n sphere, but I do know, um, <coughs> oh, let me just point out one other thing, that if n varies, if I take, um, so this gives me a map. Um, If I, if I compose this with the inclusion of on into on plus 1, what that does on the homotopy theory side is it suspends the map. So one, did I do something wrong again? The vibration, you are taking the usual vibration, right? Oh, sorry. There is a 50 50 chance it was you and me. time. <laughs> Just means if you try again. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, 
Okay, so that's suspense. Now, um, I want to, uh, so let's, if you don't know anything, um, there's still one interesting vector bundle you can, pick, you can think of over the k-sphere. Every, the sphere is a manifold, so it has a vector bundle. And so, in particular, there's the tangent bundle. There's the tangent bundle to the sphere. Okay, so let's see. That would be the case k equals n. So I have the tangent bundle to Sn, which is an element, which is an n-dimensional vector bundle over the n-sphere. And that gives me an element in pi 2n minus 1 of the n-sphere. <clears throat> and that element, um, so that, that has a kind of compounded name. It's called the Whitehead square, or the Whitehead product. So the homotopy groups of spheres has this graded Lie algebra structure, which I'm not going to talk very much about, uh, except it's used in it's 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 used in naming this element. Um, that Lie bracket is called the Whitehead product, um, and this this element is also often just called the Whitehead product, the Whitehead product of the identity with itself. So that's an element. Um, now, if I if I add, so that if I add one, one trivial vector space to the tangent bundle of the sphere, it becomes the trivial bundle. So that goes to zero here. Um, so that goes to the trivial bundle here, and that means that this element, the whitehead square, suspends to zero. So it's an element in the homotopy groups of spheres that vanishes after one suspension. On the other hand, if the... I'm sorry? This is actually a Lee super algebra. Okay, so yes, we gradedly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, it's, it's a graded Lie algebra, and the grading is actually one off. Well, let's don't... Uh, Let's don't get into that right now. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, okay, right. So that element suspends to zero. <clears throat> On the other hand, um, suppose that the uh, suppose that the n sphere had had uh, vector field. Right, so suppose that the tangent bundle actually could be reduced by, um, suppose I could write that as, uh, as coming from an n minus j dimensional vector bundle. <clears throat> okay, so, so we could ask this question, does there exist some uh, t primed in here going to the tangent bundle to the n-sphere. And that's then related to the question of whether the whitehead product um, is in the image of the sus iterated suspension map. <clears throat> and in fact, I won't take the time to write down a statement, but it's a theorem of, of um, of, I, I think, uh, of James and Whitehead, and I'm actually maybe even both Whiteheads, I'm sorry, I, I don't actually remember at the moment, that, the, um, that these two problems are equivalent, that the, the problem of, of uh, relating vector fields on spheres, the problem of constructing vector fields on spheres, and the problem of writing the Whitehead square in, in the image of the homotopy groups of spheres, in the image of the iterated suspension map, these are actually equivalent problems. So this is kind of another role, it looks like, for the homotopy groups of spheres. It's telling you something about some geometric problems. And in fact, a lot of problems, uh, in, in a lot of geometric problems, come down to understanding things about the, the Whitehead square. And I'll just mention one uh, quickly while I'm moving along here. Um, that. <coughs> One interesting one, um, an old question uh, is when is, is 
times the Whitehead square zero, or uh, when is it divisible by just zero mod two? So these are two questions that come up um, in, in many ways in connection with geometry and, uh, and, in, and they play important roles in understanding things about the homotopy groups of spheres. These questions turned out to have sort of um, difficult, uh, these, these turned out to be important problems and, and they took a lot of technology to solve. So this problem, the vector fields on spheres problem and this problem were solved by atoms. And, um, and the answer is that, well, the vector field problem, I won't state the answer to, but the, um, <coughs> the whitehead squared being zero is the Hopf invariant one problem. And the answer is only when n equals uh, one, three, or seven. And the white about the, the existence of that T prime is that the same as, as having J everywhere linearly independent? Yeah, J yeah. Linear. Sorry, I said that in words facing the board, but yeah, right. That's equivalent to having J linearly independent vector fields. So I'm not, so I'm, but that's equivalent to a problem about the homotopy groups of spheres. And this other one about the whitehead square being divisible by two. Um, that's a recent, or a couple years ago now, a result of, of Mike Hill, myself, and Ravenel. And that's only when n equals 1, 3, uh, 7. So those are easy. If it's 0, it's 0 mod 2. But then 15, 31, 60, uh, uh, sorry, 63, and then there's one dimension and maybe 127. So we actually solve this problem but leave one dimension open. Okay, so I'm, I know this is a little, a, a little, uh, I mean these problems in the homotopy groups of spheres, they, they may not be so easy to relate to, but the, the point I wanted to make, um, is that we're studying, we're only seeing a part of homotopy theory as we formulate and, and approach these questions. And that, that's the part that comes from approximating maps between spheres by parameterized families of linear maps. So this, these, the, the origin of these questions and their interface with homotopy theory comes from only looking at part of homotopy theory and it's the part that roughly has to do, as I said, with studying linear approximations to maps. Um, well, it's not zero for even n. <laughs> no, for even n, the, it's the grading, the grading is shifted by one. For even n, it's, um, it's got Hopf invariant two, and so it's not zero. Um, we could ask about dividing it by two, but let me, but um, let me just, um, we'll, come, we'll meet some of these questions again in a minute, but let me, um, I just kind of wanna, wanted to point out some of the classical problems, although in, in topology and some of the recent solutions, but, but also point out that at least the asking of the question involves studying linear approximations, in some sense the linear approximation to homotopy theory. Okay, so I wanna, um, I wanna continue on this a little bit. So that's if we just randomly try to think about vector bundles we can physically see on spheres. Um, but we do a little bit better if we ask about um, stabilizing vector bundles. So I, I want to make a different diagram. I'm going to take, now I'm going to go back to k-dimensional vector bundles on the n-sphere. That maps to pi n plus k of at, uh, minus 1 of Sn. And I could instead, I could, 
I could um, embed this in the Grotendi group completion of all vector bundles on spheres. So that's the group KO of SM. And I might as well, um, if I'm going to add and subtract and stabilize, I might as well um, restrict myself to K, just KO zero. I might as well restrict the virtual dimension to be zero. <clears throat> and on this side, well, so that's, that's the same as if I um, let the dimension of the vector bundle get large. And that's the same here as if I let, um, I switched N and K. Thank you. I was, I was about to. Uh, reach a contradiction in mathematics. So, uh, so, all right, I won't do it again, but I'll do it here. Thank you. Okay. So that these groups, these groups are independent of n when n is large, and the common value of those is known as the stable homotopy group. So k minus one stable, and if I want n, I'm just going to take n out of the picture and normal and call it zero. So, so what we were talking about here had to do with unstable phenomena, and this, this connects, this is, this is sometimes called the stable J-homomorphism, which relates the K-groups of spheres to the stable homotopy groups of spheres. <coughs> now, there's a, a really amazing theorem about this. Um, And in some sense, this represents the most sophisticated part of the homotopy groups of spheres that is really easily understood. And um, so Adam's theorem says that, uh, so I'm going to suppose k is congruent, is, um, is zero. Let's see. Um, I'm going to restrict to k divisible by four, OK? so. Um, so let me write it like this. So the image of J in pi 4k minus 1 is a, is a sum and, and it's cyclic of order the denominator of B2k over 4k. Where the B2K is the is the two kth Bernoulli number. So of course we know these denominators by the von Stout theorem, and um, and this uh, this gives us um, uh, it gives us a lot of non-trivial information about the homotopy groups of spheres. And he doesn't abstractly just prove that it is a sum and he produces a map out to a group of that order, and. So he actually produces the splitting. So this is a, this is a, uh, it's a striking theorem, and it inspires all kinds of connections between homotopy theory and number theory. And I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to be able to explore very many of those. But one of them that, that um, um, so there are the, there's the, I mean, one very interesting thing that, that uh, was a program many years ago was to to take the so the Coomer congruences between these Bernoulli numbers give you a p-adic interpolation of them and you can understand this sequence of cyclic groups um, uh, in terms of a p-adic L function and there was a, a one of the connections with number theory uh, that I and and this kind of homotopy theory is to try to generalize that but I'm I'm afraid I'm just gonna toss that out there, and uh, I think given what I want to say today, I'm not going to have time to get back to it. Anyway, there's a lot, just to point out that there are, this creates a lot of compelling relationships between homotopy theory and other parts of mathematics. Now, this same thing comes up in a, in a different connection. Um, so Adams also calculated, he determined these groups, um, he determined all of the image of J. Um, but I just wanted to focus in this dimension. So a similar formula comes up in work of Kerver and Milner. Um, so so they showed that the order of a group 
So this is the group of smooth structures on the 4K minus 1 sphere, or um, smooth structures up to H cobordism, which is the same as diffeomorphism in dimensions greater than 5. So I'm just going to say the group of smooth, um, well, this is the group of homotopy spheres. That that, um, that that group has order um, two factors, pi b. Pi is the order of the f uh, of the stable homotopy groups of spheres in that dimension, and b is oh, I always forget these powers of two. Oh, it's a m. Uh oh. better way to do this. <laughs> AK, 2 to the 2K minus 2, 2 to the 2K minus 1, times B, 2K over 4K, where AK is um, 1 if, uh, oops, if K is even, and 0, or 2, oops, if K is odd. All right, so this gives a formula for the number of smooth structures up to diffeomorphism on the sphere. And it involves, um, well, it's an, an amazing formula in its own right. It involves quantities from three different parts of mathematics, uh, sort of differential topology, homotopy theory, and basically number theory. Yeah, wait, where? What? Sorry. Oh, did I? Oh, I might have. Uh, yes, yeah, so good, right, good. Um, we're in agreement on that. Um, that means next time. No, that. Uh, no. So notice that. Um, so, right, so notice that. This side's an integer. It's the order of a group. This side is a, an integer times a rational number, right? So it somehow has to work out to be an integer, and it, it exactly does, right? The atoms summand, the atoms part of the homotopy groups of spheres exactly cancels with the denominator here, and I'm left reconciling that this is an integer. So that's a, that gives some meager connection, at least at the level of numerology, between Adam's work and the Kerver Milner work. In fact, it's much deeper, and there's, there's a, this, this product formula comes from a, a studying a certain long exact sequence, and the behavior in that long exact sequence makes a deeper use of Adam's, Adam's work. So I can't... Um, K minus one, two to the 4K minus three. No, I, I, um, I just didn't trust my ability to add at the chalkboard. But it also is a problem. <laughs> I would have, uh, if, even if it had been the other formula, I would have written it that way, just so I wouldn't make a mistake. But yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah. OK. <laughs> So this is a little bit of a survey. So this is, um, wait, there was one other thing I wanted to say about this. Oh, yeah. So Adam solves this problem in all dimensions. He, solved, he works out the image of J. It's always a sum and in other dimensions. And Kerver and Milner also work out this group in all dimensions, although there's one place, there's a number they can't um, settle. So let me just say that. So the order of... Um, of theta 4m is, um, uh, I guess the way to write it is, oh, I'll get right with a k, is 1 half a k times the order of pi f uh, 4k. And in dimension um, 4m plus 2, sorry. 
uh, as you can probably tell in my notes, I used m, and for some reason I'm using k now. Um, so that's equal to um, the order of pi 4k plus 2 times um, maybe a factor of 1 half and the order of pi uh, of 4k plus 1 is um, the same number am times the order of pi 4k plus 1 times, again, a possible factor of 1 half. So um, I think I won't take the time to write it out, but the... AK? AK. AK, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. Okay. So. So these, um, these factors of one half that, that the Carver Milner can't settle, they're, well, it's easy to describe them. Um, so it's easy to write down uh, a, a manifold that might be an element in this group or it might not. So, um, so if, you take the, if you take two copies of the tangent bundle to an odd sphere, So this is supposed to be, that's supposed to be an odd sphere. And then this is, a, this is the unit tangent bundle. If I take two copies of the unit tangent bundle and glue them together near a point by reversing the role of the, I mean, locally that's a product of, of two Euclidean spaces, and glue them together by reversing the role, then the boundary of this is a topological sphere. And if it has a smooth structure, um, it's, um, so the question is, can it be smooth? If it can be smooth, it's a non-trivial element in one of these groups. And if it can't, it's not. And that was the, that was the manifold that they couldn't, they couldn't deal, they couldn't decide on. And that, that accounts for both of these factors of two. So I won't write it out, but this is, this is equivalent to this problem of dividing the whitehead square by two. And it's the problem that, uh, Mike Hill and Doug Ravenel and I solved, and we know that except in six cases, these factors of two, ha one half aren't there. Okay, so that's been kind of a long-winded buildup, uh, but in some sense, this is like the sweet spot of, of so I started out talking about the, the role the homotopy groups of spheres played, and, and, one, and in one hand, it was telling us about manifolds through Pontryagin's construction, and it was telling us about manufacturing topological spaces from Whitehead's picture, and, um, and in some sense, the, when, the, when those, those come together, um, th those points of view come together in a significant way in, in this whole circle of ideas, in all of these problems, in solving all of these problems um, about the image of J, about constructing manifolds, and in some ways that's really, this is the sweet spot of that point of view on the role of, of the homotopy groups of spheres. Um, but this is only seeing part of the homotopy groups of spheres. It's only seeing the elements that come from linear approximations to maps or parameterized families of linear maps, and it's only seeing a piece of homotopy theory. And what I want to focus on for the rest of the talk is how we, how, what the other parts of homotopy theory are, how we see them, and what, what roles they might be playing in, in, um, in mathematics. Now, I said this was the sweet spot, and I said this stuff had to do with um, with sort of the linear approximation to homotopy theory, but that wasn't quite true. The technology that goes into uh, removing these factors of one half, or that goes into this pro problem about when the whitehead square is divisible by two, um, involves in a fundamental way homotopy theory, a, a, a different part of homotopy theory. Okay, so, um, so that's a little bit of a, a warm up in a just some background and some history of the subject, and it, and um, it's really striking if you go back and read some of these old papers, especially the solution to the vector field problem. Uh, just just how much these different points of view uh, are are being used, and how how much, well, these two points of view, as I said, the connection with manifolds and the connection with uh, maps between spheres, as the fundamental uh, uh, two, uh, ingredients for manufacturing topological spaces. One, am I supposed to get the three sphere? Am I supposed to get the answer of one? 
Um, I'm not, this is only for K, for this number bigger than, let's say K is greater than or equal to 2. I'm supposed to. So it's supposed to get 28 or 2? Uh, I think so, do I not? Well, maybe. I didn't check. I checked one and I it wasn't <laughs> taking one, but the two are okay. Uh, I think. Sorry? It is the first number that you I think you are getting 28. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that gets 28. I think, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, this identifying this with uh, this group of smooth structures has, uses the H cobordism theorem. And so I need to be in dimensions greater than 5. Now, I want to. I want to tell you a little bit about how atoms. Um, I need to tell you a little bit about how atoms m determine the image of J. And what Adams did was that he he studied the following situation. Given a map from uh, 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 given a map between spheres. So given a stable map, well, let's, let's, well, um, we get an element in, um, we get an element, we can study this map in K theory, okay? So that gives us a map from the K theory of Sn to the K theory of Sn plus K minus 1. Now, most of the time, that map is not going to be interesting. Most of the time, where the group, the groups here you're interested in, the, um, this will, that this, that either one of these groups will be zero or um, you'll be mapping a torsion, this, this torsion element, an element of finite order to an infinite group and it'll have to be zero. And so to refine that, um, Adam studied the action of the automorphism group of K theory on, um, on, on the K theory of SN. And so I think that, that why don't I, I'm just going to, I need to kind of jump, I, I need to get through some sophisticated apparatus fairly quickly, and I think it's a distraction if I go through it in detail. So I'm going to do it a little bit metaphorically. So from one point of view, um, we think of KO as a ring. Well, let me just say it this way. So he studied um, the, he studied the, um, he mapped the homotopy groups of spheres to something about the automorphism group. of the K-theory spectrum acting on the KO groups of spheres. Let me just write that as KO star. Okay, so, <clears throat> I mean, this is what you would meet. Um, imagine, if you're thinking more algebraically, think of K-theory as a ring, and you're trying to, you're trying to understand the sphere um, by using descent. We're trying to use faithfully flat, we're trying to use some kind of descent spectral sequence to understand the homotopy groups of spheres from the K groups. And what Adams did was, was study that, I mean, he invented that spectral sequence in homotopy theory, and he, he was studying that in the case of K theory, and he was able to calculate these, relate them to Bernoulli numbers, and produce the, the, um, the splitting map of the image of J. Okay, so in other words, um, Al Adams manufactured an approximation. So, so Adams manufactured an approximation to the homotopy groups of spheres, or to to. Um, um, to, uh, to homotopy theory using K theory, or KO theory, and we call that, um, we now call that K local homotopy theory. Again, if you're, if you're thinking sort of from the algebra, algebra geometric point of view, 
imagine the homotopy, the spectra, the homotopy groups, imagine that you're studying sheaves on some scheme and um, you're, you have some sheaf of rings that's just supported at one point and you try to do descent. What you're gonna, what you're gonna recover about your original sheaf is just, um, is just what that looks like in a formal neighborhood of this point, or you're just going to study the, you're just going to see, um, so this line here sort of represents all of homotopy theory, and this, and this represents K theory, and Adam studied the, uh, the formal neighborhood of K theory inside of all of homotopy theory. Okay. Um, Um, so they'll all have the same formal neighborhood. Um, so the, I, I should have, I, I, at some point I was going to switch to ordinary K theory and hope nobody noticed because it generalizes a little easier. But, um, but they all wind up having the same, the same completion and um, it's just that some of the computations work a little better. Here. I'm, uh, oof. So, so this generalizes. So, um, so there's some. So this we can generalize this using other cohomology theories. And so it's a little bit difficult to say in. Um, say explicitly which ones I want to use. Well, let me, let me first say that um, there's, it's a, there's a little bit of an art to choosing the right cohomology theory to, to use. And um, some names that, that, that belong here are, of course, Adams um, and Novikov and Quillen. Um, sorry, I'm a little worried about the time management, so I, I think I need to be as brief as I can at this particular moment. Um, so we need to pick particularly nice cohomology theories, and a particularly nice class are the complex-oriented. So that means I have um, complex oriented means I have churn classes for complex vector bundles. Okay, so <clears throat> so these churn classes, so let there um, so V goes to C M in E of V. So if V is a vector bundle over some space, the mth churn class will be in some generalized cohomology group of V. And these satisfy the, the usual properties. So they're, um, they're normalized, meaning C1 of the tautological bu line bundle. Um, so that's, um, that's the tautological line bundle over the two sphere. Over P1, that corresponds That corresponds to the unit in E0 of a point. So the, so the theory is normalized. The, um, they, are, uh, they have a Carton, they're natural, and they have a Carton formula. Okay, and then this is enough already to imply um, that the first, there's a formula for the first churn class of a tensor product of two line bundles. Where X is the first churn class of L1 and Y is the first churn class of L2. 
So this, this data is already enough to show that the first Chern class of a tensor product of two line bundles is given by a formal power series in the cohomology of a point of the first Chern class of each of the individual factors. And in fact, by the um, associativity of the tensor product, this gives a formal group law over E star, over the coefficient ring. Now, there's a lot that goes into this, and, um, and there's a, this relationship between cohomology theories and formal group laws is, for some, in, in some parts of homotopy theory, it's, it's remarkably tight, um, and in some places, there's, um, it's, it's not. Um, so I don't know of any proof that every formal group law comes from a cohomology theory, but I also don't know of any counterexamples. Um, there's also places um, for some families of formal group laws, you can, for some restricted kinds, you can functorially produce cohomology theories with very good properties, and, um, and then you can show uh, for some kinds you can't make such a functor. So, um, but nevertheless, I'm gonna pretend that everything works um, works the way I, um, E is a, I mean, E for me is going to be, yeah, a ring spectrum, but I didn't want to, right, meaning it has, uh, E is a ring spectrum which has churn classes for complex vector bundles, but um, that's not going to play a big role. The, What I want, I just didn't want to be really vague about this, but I wanted to introduce some higher analogs of K-theory. Uh, I'm sorry? No, of K-theory itself, not the J-homomorphism. Right? So, <clears throat> so just bear with me. This part is going to go a little quick, and then I'll, I'll get back to more concrete statements. But So let me let um, gamma n be the... Um, be a height n formal group law. Um, so this will be, so. Over, um, let's say, uh, let's say fp, the field with, oh, I have to pick a prime p. So now I, I forgot to say that. Now I'm going to complete everything at a, at a, at a, at a, at a rational prime p. And, um, and, and study homotopy theory that way. So I'm looking at, um, I want to choose a height n formal group law. The height just means that the rank of the p torsion subgroup is n. So this is like a group of, of p rank n. <coughs> and, um, and if you want to be canonical, perhaps I should have said the algebraic closure of fp, but that's not going to play a, an important role. And then um, I'm going to let, uh, let Rn be the ring of functions on its universal deformation. So that's a formal mod, it's a formal power series ring in n minus one variable. And now there's a, theorem, which I'm not going to quite state, uh, um, but it says, let me just say theorem, and in, in, in various levels of sophistication, it's due to Landweber, uh, to myself and Haynes Miller, and to Jacob Lurie, um, and it says that you can uh, functorially associate to this some um, a cohomology theory. So you can which I'll call E N and E N pi in E N zero of a point is R N and the formal group law. Uh, reduces mod the maximal ideal to gamma n. Okay. 
So it, I didn't, um, it's Z graded, but it's periodic. It's like K theory. It's, yeah, it's like K theory. Um, so when N equals one, this is K theory. So when N equals one, E one is K theory, P adically completed. And um, for higher N, it's some higher generalization of K theory. And <clears throat> so there's other things here. So the, um, with P adic, uh, P adically completed. Gamma 1 is GM, the formal completion of GM. I'm sorry, I'm having one of those moments where I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I've, I'm compressed for time here, and I, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to get bogged down in this, because I think it, what I'm about to say will be easier to understand. I just want to produce a bunch of analogies. I'm going to produce, tell you a bunch of things about vector bundles, which will be the n equals 1 case, and then I want to just um, tell you what we know about the higher n case. And, I, and I'm afraid if I, if I spend too much time being, um, give, being very precise about this, uh, I'll be too rushed for the easier to understand part. So, so just forgive me that there's this, there is a series of these higher generalizations of K-theory. And, uh, and Adam's calculation, which had to do with the autom automorphism group of the multiplicative group, this automorphism group of K-theory, um, that's described in terms of uh, the automorphism group of this height n formal group. So, so the, all of the algebra Adam's used it, is sort of tooled up to be used here and understand the higher completions of K-theory. So, so we have, so the upshot of all of this is, there's an analog of K theory for each um, N. So this is completed at a prime P, and by analog, when N equals one, I mean the exact same guy. I, so K theory is the case N equals one, and there's an analog of, of this, and then there's an analog of, and then there's, um, then there's the, so sometimes, so this is the part of homotopy theory. This represents the part of homotopy theory that we would see if we tried to make Adam's calculation using the nth analog of K theory. So this is the nth analog of Adam's image of J. <clears throat> Okay, so what I, what I wanted to do um, today, mo, mo, or the way I wanted to end today, was by describing a, a series of things that we know about K-theory and trying to, and telling you what we know about their higher analogs. So K-theory has to do with vector bundles, and so I should tell you, take things about vector bundles and tell you, um, tell you higher analogs of these. <clears throat> So here are some things about, about K-theory and vector bundles. So, um, so one thing is that, um, let's suppose I have a, a finite group G um, and we, one thing we can do with vector bundles in K-theory is we can study uh, the representations of G. Just a sec. So this will be, I mean, I could just talk about individual vector spaces. I'll see a little bit more if I think about the representations of a finite group. So this has, um, so here are some things we know about the, rep, the, the Grotendi group of representations of a finite group. One is it has um, an inner product. comes to us with an inner product because the, um, 
it has a canonical basis, the basis of irreducible representations, and those are orthonormal under the inner product. Um, it contains in it, so that's a ring, and its group of units contains in it um, something, a very, it contains in it just the group of homomorphisms um, from G into uh, U1, or um, let me write this topologically already, H2 of the classifying space of G with integer coefficients. And um, I think I'm going to cut my list short there. So those are two things that, um, that I have. <clears throat> So I have to, I was going to explain these ideals in more detail, but I think given the time, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to have to, uh, I'm just going to report on the answer then. So, so there's, uh, so this, so this generalizes in kind of a, an amazing way to all n. So, so there's a generalization of this that's true, it's even, generalizes in the case of K-theory. So, um, so rep G, if G is a P group, well, rep G is related to the K-theory of the classifying space of G. Okay. <clears throat> so, so one generalization, so, so, uh, so this is a theorem that's due to myself and Jacob Lurie, um, and I'm writing his name bigger than mine uh, for the obvious reasons. So, so one, so the, so one is that um, that uh, if X, so let me make a definite. So if X is a finite homotopy type, then then all of these. Um, has a non, has a canonical non-degenerate inner product. Um, so a finite homotopy type means that the um, so finite homotopy type. means uh, finitely many non-degenerate homotopy, non, uh, finitely many non-zero finite homotopy groups. Uh, I'm not getting that out. I mean, f oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so finite homotopy type means um, it has, um, it means that all the homotopy groups are finite. Maybe the fastest way to say is that the direct sum over all n of pi n of x is finite. So there's only infinitely many of those are non-zero, and, and those are finite. OK, so I don't quite have time to explain where this, this comes from, but it's part of actually a much stronger a more sophisticated theorem, and it tells you, in fact, um, it tells you that you can do, the, the, the more sophisticated theorem says that um, um, you have transfer maps. You can do push forwards. cohomology uh, for, for maps whose fibers are finite homotopy types.
So, so that's one thing that, um, that you have for all n. Um, so this is something that was true also for K-theory, but we didn't really know how to see it because um, K-theory, the K-theory of an Eilenberg maclean space K pi n is for n greater than or equal to two is zero. So we couldn't, we couldn't really quite see this result. We couldn't, it, it, I stated something that doesn't appear to depend on n and um, it didn't ever depend on n even when n was only equal to one. We just couldn't see it because we could only see, because uh, we were only witnessing things in very low dimensions. So I'm going to use this in a minute, but I want to say that's, that's one thing that the, that the, the inner product on the representations the, um, has an analog, has, has sort of a, a very sophisticated generalization. Now the other thing, the other thing about, about vector bundles, about vector spaces in K-theory is that sitting inside the group of units is the, is the group of characters in the sense of homomorph, of one-dimensional representations of G. And that also has a generalization. And this theorem um, is really due to Ravenel and Wilson. And that says for any x, um, the units, well, let me just say there's a canonical map. from h n plus 1 of x with integer coefficients. Now this is any x, not just a finite homotopy type, to the units in E n of x. So you're supposed to, what you're supposed to think is that this, that somehow, so H2, you know, that's something that's easy to study from a lot of points of view. H2 is line bundles on a space. And we, um, we often play those points of view against each other. The reason we know the Hodge conjecture for H2 is because we can relate H2 to line bundles. And what, we, what happens, what this theorem is telling us is that, that there's some other theory, these higher versions of K-theory, that play that same role, the, the, role, the relationship between H2 and line bundles is generalized to higher cohomology. So the place I wanted to bring this talk to was I wanted to, um, I wanted to exploit both of these points of view um, and, and state a, explain a conjecture. But um, now I'm really, um, I'm, now I, I've used my hour. Uh, how seriously shouldn't I worry about time? <laughs> All right, I'll just go for, um, I, I know what I'll do. I'm gonna set an alarm for 10 minutes. And I'm gonna make it be, uh, I'm gonna make it be a really scary, okay, there we go. <laughs> See, maybe 11. All right, now I hope, okay, now we're, now we're racing. Okay, so, what's that? So, um, on, yeah, maybe I should put this microphone by it to make it really scary. Okay, now I wanna relate all of these to um, topological quantum field theories. So this takes some, some build up. So, all right, so, uh, so this is something else, right? A topological quantum field theory um, you typically have some space X, which I'm going to eventually think of as a finite homotopy to a type, and I have a manifold of dimension D, which I'm going to think of as framed so that there's no geometry in it except for sort of the homotopy theory part of the geometry. So it's a framed manifold, and X is some space of fields, and you typically have so or let me, let's make it n, so I want to talk about an n-dimensional theory. And on the space of maps, so the space of maps from my n-manifold to x, that's some space of fields on my manifold. And I have a, a classical action, or an exponentiated action, which is a function to u1. <clears throat> All right, and then um, typically you, you associate to your manifold um, the the integral over this whole space of fields 
the, um, uh, uh, the action. Uh, so I've written s, uh, normally you would write e to the 2 pi i s, but, um, but let, me, let me just use s for the exponentiated classical action. So I'm supposed to integrate this, and I'm supposed to get a complex number. Um, this is um, an n-manifold. And then, um, um, and then if I was to do this for n minus one manifolds, um, well now what this s is supposed to give me So now what I have is instead of a map to this, I have a map to B of U1 or KZ2, and this gives me a line bundle. And now the integral, so let me also call that S, is now a vector space. Or maybe it's a K-theory class. It gives me a vector space somewhere, and these satisfy the usual relations of a topological, of a, of, a, of a field theory, and one would like to actually be able to make these integrals precise. One would like to be able to, to take, to define a topological quantum field theory by giving a classical action and actually performing these, these path integrals. And there are certain situations when you can do this, and I should have put some names up here, so in addition to, um, so, So there's digraph, this is sort of built on starting with digraph Witten theory, and then um, there's a lot of work with Freed and Telemann and myself and Jacob Lurie. Okay. So, so one of the issues in, in continuing this is trying to figure out, is, is just trying to find what kind of objects you're producing in the end. So if I was to go down to something in dimension n minus 2, my classical action would be, um, so, if I went down to co-dimension 2, I would have some action which Matt went to some kz3, and I would need some place, and I'm supposed to think of this as sitting inside the units of something, in the way these were unit complex numbers and these were unit vector spaces. I'm supposed to think of these as sitting inside the units of something and I'm supposed to add them up. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll just say, I'm going to say, I have to say this very quickly, but the, the two features that I just described. Thank you. <laughs> So this is supposed to set up some point that, um, that you, can, you can always do this in this KN local world. So in the KN local world, so this does sit inside, right? This does sit inside the units of this generalized generalization of K-theory. So, uh, so I think I have to kind of try to make this, uh, I'm going to, um, <laughs> Oh, I still got five minutes. All right. So, the, I, I still think I'm going to just say this in words. But um, one of the issues of trying to give a purely topological approach to the construction of topological field theories is the difficulty of of writing down precisely what target category you want to use. As soon as we start, you know, we're as soon as we start de-looping vect. We, we take complex numbers, we go to vect, we, we start de-looping the apparatus of, of, of you know, getting a, a, good, a good candidate for a place to do your path integral gets difficult. Um, but I can combine both of these things uh, that I was describing, okay? So the map KZN plus one to the units in EN and this and the push forwards for finite homotopy types these let you um, these allow you to um, these let you build um, 
these let you actually do these path integrals. Okay, so you can do um, you can do these path integrals. Um, EN theory. Okay. <clears throat> now, th these aren't going to give you particularly interesting answers a lot of the time, but there are various modifications of these EN theories that you can make, and, um, and you'll get more interesting answers. Um, and so one place where I don't know how to connect these ideas is that that Removing those factors of two, or that dividing the whitehead square by two, had to do with n equals four. So that, that used part of homotopy theory that's in the fourth analog of K-theory. And um, it would be nice to understand that from the point of view of a topological quantum field theory. Now, I promised you a, connect, uh, a conjecture, and I, I don't think I'm going to quite have time to state it properly. Um, so. Um, actually, maybe I'll I should just wrap this up here. There's a more precise conjecture about this that I'll just have to tease you uh, by saying I know it and, and you don't. <laughs> but um, but <laughs> no, there's a. Maybe I'll just say a word about it. When you when you start delooping these, when you start doing these path integrals with line with line bundles you soon realize that that's not quite adequate and you really need to use Z2 graded lines. I mean, there's more units in the representation ring. There's line bundles and there's minus a line bundle. And that's, it's even the multiplication structure is a little subtle. You have to regard minus a line bundle as odd and use the Kazool sign rule when you multiply. So this has a, um, this has a generalization to all N and the generalization's rather, um, striking, that Z2, the grading, is the character group of, of the first, of pi 1 of the sphere, the first stable homotopy group of spheres. And what you get if you pursue that is you find that um, your classical action is not supposed to be taking values in an Eilenberg maclean space, but into something whose lower homotopy groups are the character groups of the homotopy groups of spheres. And we saw the Z2 grading was just the first part of the, uh, that was the character group of pi one. And the conjecture, so there's a map that factors this into the unit C in the end through this universal space that has all those characters in it. Um, that was, that's a consequence of other results of myself and Ravenel and Wilson. And the conjecture has to do with, um, with, uh, with identifying that with a different object. But anyway, there's, so I, I, I'm saying this because um, I started out by talking about the role of the homotopy groups of spheres in different parts of mathematics, or the role that they seem to play in mathematics, and it had to do with studying spaces of manifolds moving through cobordisms and the manufacturing of topological spaces. And what seems to be emerging, and what's emerging from these kind of considerations is that Oh, and that only seems to intersect the K1 local part of homotopy theory. And what seems to be emerging from these kind of pictures and, and has been for a while is that, um, that these, that to see, to meet these higher sectors in topology, we have to not regard spaces of manifolds moving through cobordisms, but think of them as topological quantum field theories, so that the maps, a cobordism doesn't correspond to a reversible relationship between the two boundary pieces. And, um, and what's emerging from this is that, um, oh, should I just stop? This, I think this alarm's broken. <laughs> okay. Uh, questions. Oh yeah, I was okay. All right, questions. Yes, please short questions. So, is there a good bound for pi two n minus one of a set for R n? A bound for the size? There is a bound. Uh, I, I don't I don't know if there's a good a good bound, but there's bounds on the size. What's that? It can have various torsions, not just two torsions. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. It can have all kinds of torsions.
<laughs> we, we have another talk, and we, everyone needs some coffee, right? So, uh, so when do we start? So we're going to we have 12, 12, 20. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Very nice and very interesting. I'm pupil of Rochlin. What's that? Yeah.